I'm going to tell you a, a really incredible story um, that I have firsthand information on. Uh, the story begins at Loring Air Force Base in northern Maine near Limestone back in 1975. The 42nd Bomb Wing consisted of uh, two air refueling squadrons and a bomber squadron. The bomber's uh, mission was uh, to support emergency war orders armed with nuclear weapons. I'd like to give you some background about the UFOs over Loring uh, before we get into the details of the uh, formation flight. A couple of weeks, or maybe even a, as few as a couple of days before this particular formation flight, uh, a meeting was called by the 42nd Bomb Wing for all of the flight crews, for all three of the flying squadrons, uh, to be held at the alert facility. So, this was unusual. It was the first time that it happened for me and all the time that I had been there, so I was kind of curious as to what this is going to be about. So, at the beginning of the meeting, a uniformed major says, listen, if you don't have a... Uh, Security clearance of at least secret, you need to leave. There was only a couple of people that got up out of the couple hundred people that were there. The major started off by saying, if you haven't heard, there has been a UFO reported over the base, over the nuclear-armed B-52s that are on alert, over the nuclear weapon storage facilities that had nuclear weapons stored at them at this time. So it was um, very very serious situation, and that's what this meeting was all about. It's uh, hovering uh, without making any sound. It does have a few lights. It moves erratically. It can move very quickly, um, unconventionally, rapid straight line movements, straight vertical movements, uh, can turn with the, without any apparent radius in the turn. So it's a pretty incredible technology. The wing staff was pretty concerned about it, so they had notified SAC uh, headquarters. And we were told, uh, don't talk to anybody about it. If you have one of these incidents, you can talk to us, and uh, we'll be debriefing you. But outside of this room, don't talk about it. And we're also concerned that the uh, local press is going to get a wind of all the extra uh, ground forces and the fighters that we're bringing in to help us uh, deal with this issue. So we're going to tell them that that there's a Canadian helicopter crossing the border and, and harassing us. So I think that's pretty incredible. But that's the background for the story that I'm going to tell you. We had uh, departed Loring earlier in the day. It was a nighttime refueling mission. There were three KC-135s in this formation. I was the aircraft commander on the uh, number two aircraft in this uh, three airplane formation. Tankers formation were referred to as cell flights. There was a lot of vertical separation, a lot of horizontal separation. There was none of this. Eh, we're right flying like the fighters do. Like this kind of stuff. Now we were way, way vertically clear. I think a thousand feet and I don't know, half a mile maybe, you know, so... Uh, it wasn't very much fun. It was just kind of boring, actually, to, to be in a formation flight in a tanker. However, the the mission was um, pretty routine. Um, I don't remember. It was unremarkable in, in almost every way until we started back. Uh, and that's, that's where the fun begins. That's where the action happens. So we are coming back from a refueling mission somewhere south of New York, offshore a little ways. Uh, and I believe it was with F-4 Phantoms. Uh, just a routine training mission for both the Phantoms and for us. So as we are somewhere close, to, I think somewhere between Bangor and Portland, northbound coming back to Loring Air Force Base, the command post uh, at Loring contacted us which was um, not routine, uh, but not completely out of the ordinary. But when they asked the, the aircraft commander of the, the cell leader, the aircraft commander of the number one tanker, to change radio frequencies to stand by, they had an important 
radio call that they wanted to talk to him about. And that was pretty unusual. So it didn't take me long to say, hey, you know, I'm going to take one of my spare radios and go with and see what this guy is uh, going to get briefed on. So I tuned in. Uh, number three tanker probably had the same curiosity. He did the same thing, I'm sure. And uh, we're listening to the command post telling the cell formation leader, listen, the UFO is over the base again right now. And we want you to um, pass off the leadership of the uh, formation of the cell flight to the air, the number two aircraft. And then we want you, number one aircraft, to turn your lights out, turn your radios off, and uh, head straight to the base at your own discretion. Altitude, airspeed, path, whatever, at your own discretion. Um, which is unusual, very unusual to hear that. Uh, incredible, as a matter of fact. So I was quite shocked. So uh, the cell leader acknowledges and says, will do. So the next thing you know, I'm getting a call from him. He's contacted me and said, listen, I just got special orders. I have to depart the formation. Uh, you're going to take over leadership of the cell. Let the navigators coordinate our positions when you're ready. You got it. So the, nav the navs did that. I was convinced that we were where they said we were. I could see some of the cities, so I knew we were, were close. So I trusted the nav, and off we off we went to the initial approach fix, and um, the aircraft commander of the number one tanker turns his lights off. Don't hear any more communication, so he's now radio silent. And in the moonlight, I could see his silhouette, and down he descended into the darkness, heading straight for Loring Air Force Base. I would have loved to have traded places with him. So number two, uh, now the old number three, and number two and I, started to head to the initial approach fix, which is quite a way south of the south end of runway 36. Um, runway 36 lands to the north. So going straight to the base is uh, a lot faster and everything is uh, uh, everything unfolds uh, with that aircraft as he approaches the base well before uh, I make it to the initial approach fix. Um, I start hearing uh, tower channel frequency communications that are really exciting. Um, I've heard some combat uh, radio uh, discussions during during some bomb strikes with the uh, F-4. So, you know, I can recognize a little stress in the voices, and, and that was definitely stress in these voices. I wouldn't call it panic, but it was, and it was bordering on frantic as they're talking about um, did you see it? Where is it now? Which way did it go? Oh my God, there it goes. And, and, and it's down on this end of the runway. It's over the, over East Loring. No, it's, it's back over the, uh, alert bombers. Um, and that kind of communication back and forth, quite a few different people talking on the tower frequency. Um, I don't believe I could hear, um, the tankers, crew members uh, chiming in. I'm not sure I would have recognized them. Maybe maybe I would have. I do know that uh, when the tanker is at elevation, when the KC-135 is at elevation, uh, the uh, radar, forward-looking radar, has like 240-mile range. I'm not sure what it is. It's substantially reduced at, at ground level, and they were flying in really, really low, I believe. So the fact that they lost radar contact with the UFO in almost an instant is remarkable in itself. Uh, and then they said, I did hear the communication say something to the effect that we've lost it. And then as quickly as the communications had started on the tower frequency, they ended. So that was kind of the end of the excitement. And um, my uh, wingman and I continued our normal approach uh, to runway 36. Uh, we broke up the formation just after we hit the initial approach fix. So I landed a couple minutes later. The uh, second airplane landed and taxied in. It is in the middle of the night. There's not a lot of uh, act action going on at the base that we can see. Um, and 
we proceeded to our squadron, normal brief, brief, normal debriefing room, had a couple of beers, filled out some paperwork, and were dying to talk to somebody that knew anything about what it what had just happened out on the base. Uh, couldn't find anybody that either knew it or dared talk about it. So that was kind of the end of that night. The tanker that had uh, departed the formation and, and uh, gone off to chase that UFO was uh, um, was absent from the briefing room when we got there. And then all of a sudden I, re- I remembered that, uh, well, he must be debriefing the major, the same major that gave that uh, meeting that I talked about earlier in this clip. However, the end of the story gets even uh, a little bit more bizarre. I see the aircraft commander of the first tanker. I'm not going to say his name. Um, I've almost slipped a couple of times to say his name, but I don't. I don't have permission to get him involved in my UFO story, so I'm not going to say his name. I see him walking along um, in front of the base exchange, the BX over at Lauren. I just a couple of days after the uh, flight, I believe. So I. Pulled my truck over, got out and went running over to him and, and said, what in the hell happened the other night with that UFO? And he looks at me and he goes, I can't talk about it. I can't talk about it. You wouldn't believe me if I could talk about it. So that's the end of the story. And as incredible as it is, that's as true as I can remember. It's been a long time ago, but... I had a lot of experience at the time of that uh, incident, and I've had a lot of experience in the cockpits after that experience, but I've never had anything as incredible as that happen. Hope you enjoyed that story. I enjoyed telling it. Bye.